Namaste. So if you've been following along with our series of videos about consciousness and Upanishads, and you've tried maybe to discuss these topics with your friends or family, you've probably run into some resistance and pushback. Maybe skepticism would be the right word. <laughs> In other words, they don't want to accept it. Since it's hard for me to understand why somebody would not accept this philosophy, I had to ask ChatGPT. <laughs> now, don't laugh. Come on. ChatGPT is interesting because it's like a consensus model of all the things on the Internet that it has scanned. So actually, it's a very good thing to use if you want to find out what is the consensus view. So I asked it, why don't people want to accept Advaita? And it came up with seven answers. Dualistic worldview, attachment to ego, lack of direct experience, religious and philosophical diversity, complexity of Advaita Vedanta, cultural and social factors, and fear of losing individuality. So I'm going to go into these one at a time and talk about the common sense direct arguments that nullify these objections, since this is the context that we've been going through in the Brihadaranyakopanishad. But first, I want to show you something cool. When you get into an argument or a discussion with someone who doesn't want to accept Advaita Vedanta, no problem. Just pull out your handy dandy pocket or purse, quick reference card to the four states of consciousness and the seven levels of chakra energy and show them the whole system. So now these two tables, the four by four matrix of consciousness and the seven by seven matrix of chakra energy levels are printed on this one card. How can you get one? I mean, they're good for study, too. They're very handy. Well, we have made up a file with the graphics, both of these charts on one graphic, one piece of paper that you can print at your local print shop and have them laminated into a card exactly like this one. And then you can literally carry it with you wherever you go. Isn't that cool? So the link to download the file is in the video description below. Do download it, either the JPEG or the PDF version, depending on what your printer requires. And have them print you out one, laminate it up, and take it with you. You know, don't leave home without it. <laughs> so anyway, let's look at some of these arguments of why people won't accept this philosophy. Dualistic worldview is number one. Our language, our society, culture, social mores, and so many things assume naturally that we live in a dualistic world. And in fact, even if someone is studying consciousness or spiritual life, they may be hooked on this dualism and trying to project it even on God. And, you know, that's more or less inevitable in the beginning of spiritual life because the lowest stage of spiritual consciousness, which is Dvaita Vada, the view that everything is dualistic, even in the next highest stage in Svapna consciousness, it's called Vishishta Dvaita Vada, the view that the absolute Brahman is transformed in the creation. And so these two views are both dualistic views. Although the higher stage, Vishishta Dvaita, does assume that sometime in the future we will be able to realize the non-dual existence. 
Still, in the beginning, it's very dualistic. And this is how people get the idea of an eternal soul, of a personal God, and that we have to worship God, and that we have to do service to God, and so many other things. This is all right, as long as it's part of a path that reaches higher levels. So, I mean, even Adi Shankaracharya wrote exquisite devotional poetry to several gods, and these gods, as we've gone over so many times, are like metaphors for Brahman. And like any metaphor, of course, they're not perfect. They don't have full identity with the actual subject. But they do help us realize that there is an existence beyond this material world, higher than this material world, better than this material world and that we should strive to attain it. So in other words, we don't conceive of any philosophy or spiritual path as our enemy, inimical to the path based on consciousness. But what we see is that the stage on the path where most people are at is still, you know, pretty much down toward the bottom the uh, ordinary or default state of consciousness in the material world is dualism. So that's where everybody starts out. Sure is where I started. In other words, we should not try to conceive of these other views as being against Advaita Vedanta. But we should see them as being very early stages of spiritual consciousness leading to Advaita Vedanta. Now, the next one, attachment to ego. <laughs> Who can say that they are not attached to ego? So that's the nature of ego, is attachment to I and mine. And so whatever we conceive of as I and mine, we're going to be attached to that. And that's our ego. That's who we think we are. We're projecting our sense of existence, our sense of consciousness. And so many perceptions, memories, ideas, speculations, who knows what else going on in the mind. And collected these all in an aggregate and said, this is me. Who can live without the ego? Well, this is due to something that even very highly learned Vedantists don't know, which is that all four states of consciousness are simultaneously available. And within each state of consciousness, what is perceived is the reality. For example, in Jagrat consciousness, it appears that the body is the self. And if someone is focused on Jagrat consciousness, that's going to be their view. And you're not going to be able to pry them out of that unless you can convince them that the other states of consciousness are just as valid. In Svapna consciousness, we think that our dreams are real. And even in Sushupti consciousness, we think the void is real. So these are all conditioned consciousness. Conditioned by what? By what's missing from them. In other words, the other states of consciousness. But as soon as one understands Turiya, we realize that because we are conscious of being conscious, Therefore, actually only Brahman can do that. And as soon as we realize that, everything falls into line. We get the perspective, we get the overview. And we see that the conditioned states of consciousness are simply delimited by their objects. Jagrat is the objects of the senses. And Svapna, the object, is the mind. 
In Sushupti, there is no object. And in Turiya, the other states of consciousness are the object. Or in Turiyatita, the self alone is the object. So this is a good way to overcome this objection. Then there's the lack of direct experience. <laughs> Until we actually realize Brahman, our experience is limited to conditioned consciousness. And really the only way to experience Brahman is to act in such a way that the self becomes inclined to reveal itself. This is what Shankara says in his commentary on Katupanishad. So in other words, we have to perform activities that lead us to develop the qualities where the self feels okay about revealing itself. Then we get the realization. Like my Adi Guru used to say, don't you try to see God. Act in such a way that God wants to see you. <laughs> and that still applies. Next, religious and philosophical diversity, even under the heading of Vedic spirituality. There are so many different cults, so many different views, so many different paths of spiritual life, so many different forms of yoga, so many apparently conflicting practices and so forth. Which one is right? Well, that depends on you. The one that brings you to the next step higher on the path of consciousness is the right one for you at this time. So, like I said before, it's not that we view all these different paths and teachings as antagonistic, as enemies, or as conflicts. No. We see them as belonging to certain stages on the path where one's realization is still not complete. So it's all right. We're not against them, but rather we incorporate them into our teaching, knowing their relative importance and their degree of realization. Another obstacle or argument that you may run into is, oh, this Advaita Vedanta is so difficult. It's so complex and deep. And the teachings and the Upanishads are so complicated. How can I ever understand this if I don't have, you know, 10 years to study it full time? It might be presented like that by people whose aim is to make you think that they are very, very smart. <laughs> But because everyone is conscious, everyone has consciousness, and everyone is conscious of being conscious, they are already Brahman. This also applies to another argument that I don't want to merge into Brahman. I don't want to lose my separate identity. I don't want to just, you know, go away or disappear or anything like that. No, you don't. You don't have to. Because you are already Brahman. That is the only way we can explain unconditioned consciousness that is at the root of all consciousness. Turiya. We are already Brahman. It's not that we have to become Brahman or merge into Brahman or go to Brahman or get Brahman. I mean, this, these are all misconceptions because of not understanding what Brahman is. So it's not that we have to disappear. No, the ego will still be there in Jagrat consciousness. Don't worry, it's not going away. It's not going anywhere. Whenever you come back to Jagrat consciousness, it'll still be there. And so will all of its misconceptions. <laughs> and when we're asleep, either we're dreaming or we're in deep sleep and there's nothing. These facets of consciousness are always going to be there in their right place. 
And at the time when we're in those states, we view them as the reality. The difference is that all the states of conditioned consciousness are temporary. So at the end of every day, we get tired of being in Jagrat and we go into Svapna and we dream. And then we give that up and we go into Sushupti and there's nothing. And then we give that up and we come out into dreams and waking again. But the whole time we have been in Turiya as the watcher, the knower, the root state of consciousness. So these conditioned states are temporary, but only Turiya is permanent. And that's why it's the ultimate reality. Then somebody might claim cultural and social factors. Well, my family are all Christians. I have one friend who's like this. My family are Christians and they can't understand anything about what I'm doing studying Advaita. And if I try to talk with them, they just shut me down and tell them, tell me that I should surrender to Jesus. <laughs> so I can't reveal my name even in a YouTube comment. I can't be shown, even if I'm in a video with you, I can't show my face. You know, I have to remain anonymous and all this. Phew, we. What can I say? If you don't have the balls to stand up to people and tell them the truth about what you think, uh, you have other problems than spiritual. Okay. <laughs> you have psychological, emotional problems. Because you can't go through life living a lie. You have to be honest. Honest about what you understand, the way you see things, what you believe in, what you know, what you have realized, and who you are. And if somebody doesn't like it, well, it's just too bad. And you have to be responsible for who you are and be willing to take the consequences for being real about it. So, of course, most people are chicken. <laughs> they can't stand up to the overwhelming majority of people in the world who don't see things the way they do. But see, this is the problem. Anyone who is exceptional in any way, in intelligence, in wealth, in looks, in fame, in knowledge, in renunciation or power, or any, whatever quality it is, some people are exceptionally talented in music or in sports or in some other way. This is going to make you alienated from the common run-of-the-mill human beings, which are the vast majority, 99%. So if you're studying the highest philosophy, if you are high on the scale of self-realization, this is also going to alienate you. So you have to decide to have the integrity to get real, to admit, cop to what you really think, what you really believe in, whether or not people approve or understand or whatever, and be willing to take the consequences. The alternative is living a lie and getting all kinds of things that you really shouldn't be getting social approval, friends, acceptance by the family, maybe a job and, or something like that, that if you were out front about what you really believe in, you wouldn't be getting. But see, in the long run, what is your conscience going to tell you? Isn't your conscience going to say, wait a minute, dude, <laughs> this is not who you really are. You have to get real about who you are. And there's only one version of you. It's not that when you get together with your family members, you put on a mask. Or when you get together with, you know, people uh, maybe watching a sports event or something like that, you get up and yell and cheer when they do. And, all that. you know, I mean, come on. Who are you kidding? Only yourself. So... Part of this teaching is that there's no need to hide anything. 
because everything comes out in the end anyway. So there's no need especially to put on a false face and lie about what you think, about what you believe in. Or on the other hand, just remain silent about it and conceal your real thoughts. They're going to come out sooner or later. In an unguarded moment, somebody is going to blow your cover. You can count on it. That's just the way life is. And even if it doesn't happen like that, you're going to be miserable because your conscience is always going to be, hey, buddy, you know, <laughs> you need to get real. Hopefully, between the little uh, quick reference card and these discussions here, you will have a better way to present yourself and what you think and what you believe in as an adwaitin so that you can get along with people better and maybe even convince them. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.